we named the panel discussion progresses and challenges in fighting homophobia in football as we think uh, there's a lot of happening uh, there's a lot of progress in the past years a lot of people here participating in this seminar are doing great things in their respective football association and our league uh, but there are also still a big chunk of challenges left. So we wanted to give you with this panel debate an overview on the problem of humble football and football today, as well as show some of the progresses, show some of the good practice from a few different perspectives. Um, we decided to do so as we expect not all of you to work on the topic of homophobia and football on a regular basis. Some of you do, uh, some of you don't, uh, but that's uh, fair enough. And maybe we, um, after this seminar, some more football associations and leagues are getting started in this field as well. We invited some great panelists today, uh, each one with a certain different background on the topic, one active fan, uh, one amateur player, representatives from one of the biggest yeah. FAs, if not the biggest FAs in, in the world, the German FA, as well as a representative of uh, the Professional Football Players Union FIFPRO. Um, I'd like all the speakers to just briefly introduce yourselves, uh, just tell us what you're working, volunteering in, what's your personal motivation on being involved in the field. Good morning, everyone. So um, my name is Matthias de Rover. Um, as a profession, I'm, I'm a senior auditor at PWC, but um, that's not why I'm here for. Uh, um, so I'm also an amateur player in the third division here in Belgium. Um, and of course, I'm gay. Um, I won last year Mr. Gay Belgium, Belgium's competition of 2019. And um, as of then, I'm working together with the Royal Belgium Football Association um yeah to create more visibility in football and to to yeah to decrease uh, the homophobia um and the discriminating um yeah things in 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 football stadiums so um that's why i'm here thank you for having me and uh looking forward uh, to have a nice panel debate my name's Sarah. I played, my background is I played professional football and football for my national team in New Zealand for 10 years, retired earlier this year. And as mentioned, I'm working for FIFPRO, the Global Player Union. Uh, we at FIFPRO, obviously the anti-discrimination agenda is very close to our hearts and social justice is at the core of what we do and looking to create working environments for players all around the world that are free from discrimination. So in essence, we are a social justice movement and we certainly try to make sure that we as an organization are as inclusive as possible, but also trying to create a more inclusive footballing environment for players all over the world. I'm the uh, one of the co-founders of Proud Canaries, which was one of the first, I think it was the second, it was the first official LGBT plus fan group in the UK. So um, hot on the heels of gay gooners. And uh, so it's the official LGBT fan group for Norwich City and um, having started that and um, there was so much interest from other fans around uh, the UK that um, we got together and, and um, formed Pride in Football and I think um, we're going to hear from Steph from Pride in Football a bit later on but also um, a few of the different LGBT fan groups uh, in England got together to form Three Lines Pride um, and I've been quite involved with that and went to the World Cup in Russia with our um, flag of St George uh, with the rainbow uh, lions. Um, and so, um, yeah, my um, role continues um, at the moment, not in stadiums, but um, tr essentially trying to improve LGBT visibility in football. And that's mainly, sadly, through fans at the moment. My name is Claudia. I work for the German FA, the DFB. And um, I've been working in the field of um, anti-discrimination and for more diversity in football for now some 12 years. I've been doing that on, or I did that um, at an international um, level at the Fair Network, um, which is an um, NGO. Um, but last year I uh, changed my mind and my perspective and I started here at the DFB because I also felt it was necessary to, necessary to try to change things 
from within football and not just from the outside. And um, I think that's a big part of my motivation to um, get things changed for the better. I could imagine that it's uh, a bit complicated to come from an activist background into a uh, big old organization which is a bit formalized, uh, which has a presumption of being a bit traditional. Uh, could you tell us how that experience has been and you're working on uh, exactly also to change the atmosphere within the organization? Um, yes, that, that's definitely true, your assumptions. Um, it, it is completely different. Um, if you work for an NGO, you can um, put out demands at your will, but it doesn't mean that they actually are heard or that actually someone puts them into action. So um, now in the FA, yes, it's a big, very big organization and it has a long tradition and tradition is also often um, very monocultural. Um, but the fact that I'm in that organization that they hired me for the job also says something that there is also some room for, for change and that people like to listen and that People also like to learn how to change things for the better. And I think also it's a, a big portion of what needs to be done is raising awareness, always educating people and raising awareness. And I think that's um, that we're on, on a good way, I would say. Maybe, maybe Sarah can give her perspective on that because uh, I would guess uh, being a bit old fashioned and monocultural at least was true for many associations as well as uh, club, board, uh, club boards and uh, uh, similar. So from a player's perspective, that's not often that, uh, not often that easy to uh, feel comfortable, I would guess, uh, in a certain background when, especially if you are LGBT plus, uh, so could you tell us a bit what it's, uh, how Fifth Pro can help there and how you are working on the topic and what would you like expect the clubs of Ace and League uh, to do in favor of their player? Yeah, sure. It's interesting you raise that because we are going through a process right now and I think what we've seen for many years and the all of the we sort of term at the off field football ecosystem, uh, we have incredible diversity on the field, uh, whether that's um, all forms of identity, and we just don't see that reflected in, in the off field. And the implications of that from a player's point of view is they're not represented in those decision making bodies. And so the decisions that the bodies are making also have a negative impact sometimes on the players themselves. So it's like what we've found is a real disconnect in a lot of areas. And that's actually leading to a football environment and a football industry that isn't as inclusive as it should be and isn't as representative as it should be because of the incredible diversity that we see on the field. So FIFA Pro is very engaged in this area, I think, for a number of different reasons. Obviously, there was a horrific amount of in-stadia racial abuse in the 2019-20 season, which sort of got curtailed a wee bit for, by COVID-19, forcing everyone out of the stadiums again. But I think you started to see that the environment around the players can really affect their day-to-day -day lives and it can really mentally, physically, emotionally have a huge um, toll on them. And so we're obviously very, very engaged in making the working environment for players a lot better. And I think it just comes down to quite simply being as representative on the, on the field as we are off the field and vice versa. That's obviously a challenge for us at FIFA Pro as well, because certainly we can be monocultural too, whether that's at head office or in the player union bodies as well. So it's this very sort of internal and external reflection and also very much a journey because some forms of identification are very visible. That can be gender, obviously, skin color and those types of situations, but sexual identity can be a little bit different in that sense so it's important that we try to wrap our arms around everybody and be as inclusive as possible when we try to affect change so that no one's being left behind and no community re remains marginalized so it's very challenging but as I said in the introduction it's very much at the core of what we do because it is quite simply about making 
the decision making bodies more representative so that the decisions that they make are better they're more diverse and they can make an environment that is a lot more welcoming for people from all sorts of different backgrounds that enjoy playing football well you are also coming a bit from the the uh workers' rights perspective, as well as the human rights perspective, I would say, is that maybe an argument which can also be used towards the clubs and FAs that, uh, yeah, that uh, players will perform better if they are free to express their sexuality, if they don't have to be afraid of reaction. Yeah, absolutely. We <laughs> certainly, if you look at football as part of the entertainment sector, you want players to be able to express themselves as much as possible and have that real freedom and that creativity. So it doesn't make sense to stifle it in other areas. And certainly we see workers' rights as human rights, particularly when it comes to freedom of expression and the right to protest and for a workplace that's free from discrimination. And if that's your starting point, then the onus really is on the leagues and the clubs and the associations to to create that environment, that discrimination-free environment, whether you play football or you work for PwC, whatever it might be, you have the right to a, to a workplace that's free from discrimination, whether that's explicit or implicit. So certainly we believe very strongly that it's, it's a human rights issue and we really encourage players to understand that first of all and to exercise their right to protest, to exercise their right to freedom of expression. And just because you're playing football, it does not mean that those rights can be taken away from you. So it's hugely important that players are educated in that sense, but employers also understand that they have a huge responsibility. It's a human rights responsibility that they create an environment where people feel respected, they feel welcome, they feel included, they have equal opportunity and access. And of course, they have the fundamental right to be in a, a discrimination-free environment which means that you'll see the wonderful freedom of expression that we celebrate on the field when someone does a bicycle kick into the top right corner. We want players to feel free. We want them to feel creative because that makes the sport better. Matthias, uh, you're a, a player yourself. I looked it up. You play for KFC Exada, which I probably pronounced very terrible. I have not really a clue which league level that is. It's one of the Belgium amateur levels there is. I would guess it's a bit more relaxed and stress-free in the uh, level you are playing at. So uh, it probably won't be such a problem to play there as an uh, out and proud uh, gay footballer, or is that a prejudice? What, what's your personal experience? Well, my personal experience, indeed, you, you cannot compare um, the league where I'm playing in with the professional league, first of all. Um, it's not that we are we are making a lot of money, uh, so it's not our profession. But I think the other fact is, is indeed that we are afraid to, to tell who we are. We are afraid to, to be who we, are, we really are. Um, to tell your teammates, to tell other players, look, um, I am gay, but I do love football as well. Um, so that's, that's I think, the, the main problem. And it's for amateur players as the same as for professional players um, in that case. But indeed, it's, it's not easy um, to, to come out and it's not easy to tell um, who you really are because... It's such a macho culture within football and everybody is like expecting of you to, to follow the rules and follow the, yeah, the, the things that, that are used to everybody is seeing like, okay, he is a football player, he has a nice girlfriend, he has two or three kids. That's what everybody is, is, is seeing of a football player. But it's not always the case um, and that's what I'm trying to do although it's an amateur league but I have a lot of friends within my team and the other teams we are playing uh, against that know by now that I'm gay and as I never had like bad comments on it they all accept for accept me for who I am and I just want to to broader that and and I want to prove look um, I am a gay football player, but you also can be gay and love football and 
being accepted within within teams um and i think it's indeed it's it's very important to have role models and and to have like younger people looking up for okay that guy he is gay and he can play soccer um i i have feelings for other men as well or i don't know where i belong i have questions regarding this and that and if they they see they have a role model then it's it's really important for them that they can think oh okay i might be a good football player as well because he is doing that as well and it doesn't matter that i'm gay or that i'm straight um so in my opinion that's that's very important um that that we can can show who we really are on a play uh, on a play um on the playground and it starts all with with your your yeah your managing directors within the football club if they support more who you really are um then the steps are smaller for the players to come out yeah uh may I ask you a question on that uh, you are also one of the lgbt plus ambassadors and contact persons for the uh royal, royal belgium football association which is great um on the website if you go to the website of the rbfa there's your contact uh, and it states that anyone in the game who has questions related to their sexual orientation or gender can contact you um, and you would give him support and hints. Mm -hmm. How did you come to that role? Were you approached by the RBFA? And how often are actually people writing to you and how can you support? Yeah, so um, as I already mentioned, I, I did win the competition of Mr. Gay Belgium 2019. Um, and I wanted to do something in football because I wanted to show younger players, okay, you can be gay, You can be yourself and you can play soccer. Um, and then we worked together uh, with the Royal Belgian Football Association and we did a lot of things, but one of them is indeed if, if there are people with questions about this topic, about the LGBT plus topic, then it's better to contact someone who is playing and who, who knows um, what what he or she uh, has been through than, than just uh, approaching someone who doesn't have been through the process. Um, so therefore my contact um, is, is there. And indeed I do, I do get not a lot um, because a lot of people are afraid of, um, of asking questions and of asking themselves who, who they really are, especially within football. Um, But I did, I did receive some messages um, with the question, look, I'm not sure if I, yeah, who, who I am. I'm not sure um, if I love boys or if I love girls or I'm not feeling, feeling like someone else. And then the only thing I, I, I say to them is, look, you can talk with me and, and I, I will tell you my story, um, how I did it. Um, but it's a personal thing. I mean, it's not because it worked well for me that it will work well for you. Um, but talking with people helps. And especially with, with good friends, with family, talk about it, talk how, how, you, how you feel about it. And most of the time they will understand because everybody is afraid. I was afraid too. But when I told them then, my, my teammates, for example, their reaction was, was wonderful. So I do there, they are afraid, but they, they need to try to talk about it and, and to, to come up for who they really are because it will change their lives. Uh, I mean, they, they will be more open. They will be more enjoying the game. They don't have to think about, oh, um, do, do I think um, that they would say I'm, I'm gay or do they think I, uh, would they say something about it um, when I'm not here? Those kind of things though. So yeah, it will only improve their, their, their life um, in, in, in being themselves. So that's the, yeah, 
the the things I, I I say to them and I give give yeah feedback for them to 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 handle those those things. We we just heard from a player's perspective. We heard a bit from Claudia from an FA perspective. But you could uh, definitely tell us from a fan's perspective on your personal experiences, positive as negative. How uh, important of a step is it to set up LGBT plus fan groups or networks? Um, often I'm hearing, and you probably as well, uh, why do they need their own fan clubs? Uh, it's always them who want their own thing. Can't they be just like us? Uh, we are completely inclusive. Could you explain a bit why it is an important step to have a safe space? Yeah, I think it's really interesting because my own view has um, changed quite significantly and changed in a very short amount of time. I, when we set up, um, we we knew that gay gunas existed, and and that was primarily as a as a has a social function. So um, L, uh, LGBT supporters of um, Arsenal would maybe meet before and after matches, maybe travel to away matches together. So it's essentially social. Um, and so we thought, oh, well, we'll do the same thing. But we th there was an issue about a few people had heard homophobia at h home matches or away matches. So we did want to work to the, with the club to address that. But I think we thought, OK, we're going to be this kind of social group and we're going to talk to the club about the club sorting out homophobia. So, you know, improving stewarding, improving steward training, improving signage, that kind of thing. But actually what happened was, and, and this is, um, it, it, Karen Rose Stadium particularly lent itself to this and, and the club is a particularly community focused club. So every year they do a, a Global Canaries uh, Day and one of the matches at halftime, all the different fan groups, parade around the pitch. So that gave us the opportunity to be on the pitch with this big rainbow Proud Canaries banner. And just saying, you know, we're here, we're part of, we're part of um, the football experience in, in Norwich. And, 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 you know, we went away as well and we were on social media. And through just that visibility in the stadium, on social media, we started to change attitudes and uh, or at least um galvanize galvanize allies and um we became you know there's that kind of expression in, in english football they're one of our own you know you, you'd say of a footballer who, who's come through the ranks at your own club but there's a football family and um so yeah sure people will say why do you have to have your own group why can't you just be a fan but there are myriad different supporters groups you know there's this kind of um zimbabwe canaries or japanese canaries or, or peterborough canaries and um and there's the disability uh, um supporters association so we're just another fan group with a special interest but we're part of that football family and that you know, from, from having thought, you know, this is something the club needs to sort out. I'm right at, at the Kai, I'd say probably more in the European end of the spectrum now as a fan and saying, we as fans can sort this out. You know, it's so much better if people own the process. Can't be done by uh, fans or themselves. The, I think you need support from your club and FA. So could you explain us a bit how a, maybe what you expect for your club and also your FA in terms of as you also are an England fan and, and home and away or more away than home, probably England fan. So what do you expect from uh, your club and FA and what they are actually doing to work with you? Yeah, sure. It is uh, symbiotic and we don't want, you know, vigilantism. Um, so we do um, expect um, clubs to deliver on our own club. Um, have have been 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 great, and you know the FA, the English FA, are getting there too. Um, so um, you expect um, them to promote your visibility, to engage with you, to um, and and you know to engage at the highest level. So we have um, a regular um, interaction with the board at, at club level, and um, for, for Three Lines Pride, we get to meet with, with um, the FA executives as well. Um, and you want to see, you know, the small things like um, on social media, retweets and quote tweets. 
And, you know, even FIFA did that when we were in, in Russia. And that means so much because they have such a big stage. So we can build up our platforms, but, you know, we need to be able to use the platforms of um, the uh, football's guardians. Um, and again, it seems like a small thing, but actually, uh, again, on social media, changing um, the profiles on, uh, on Twitter and on, on Facebook and putting a rainbow there. Um, I think a lot of um, football authorities are scared. A lot of clubs are scared about doing that because they will get some flack. But actually, if you look at the process, that flack in itself engenders um, allyship because people respond and they pile on. And um, it's, it's absolutely worth doing just to have that degree of negativity that in turn becomes a huge groundswell of positivity. And um, it makes people step up who wouldn't normally. You know, we, we've talked before about um, calling it out and we've seen the fantastic um, uh, um, assertion in, um, um, I've forgotten the name of the team in uh, it's the San Diego Loyals, is that right? With Landon Donovan walking his players off the pitch. Um, it's that kind of um, being assertive. And we can do that in the stands by calling out uh, homophobia and racism and um, ableism. But, um, you know, the clubs and authorities need to do it too. And they, they can do it on, on socials. I think it's incredibly important that stuff like this happen. Players, coaches take responsibility for their fellow players, but also for other players as well. Uh, still, there are quite a few activists who think this is not happening enough, that there are too many non-LGBT plus players afraid to speak out on the topic, either because uh, people would presume that they are gay or lesbian themselves, or, and I we are also getting this from time to time that they are just not allowed to say anything because the club doesn't want to engage in any political topics. Could you say a few words on that? On or how, maybe also how we and clubs and leagues can support players to be a bit more supportive, supportive also in the public. Yeah, for sure. I think I'll I'll pick up a bit on your last point about the the fear or this defensiveness about the politici politicization of sport, which obviously the IOC with Rule 50, which has been talked about quite a bit, I think denying the fact that like human rights politics to some extent and sport don't intersect is, is a little bit naive. Um, I, going back to my earlier point, players have every right to protest, you know, as, as citizens and as people. So I think like the, that defensiveness around it and I don't know, this feeling of like it's going to taint the sporting experience is utterly ridiculous. <laughs> Certainly from my personal point of view and, and we've spoken out about against Rule 50 directly at FIFPRO as well. I think going back to the kind of picking up on what Di was saying a little bit, I think what you're seeing now uh, with this, I think all generations of players have had this social justice activism sort of undercurrent to them but I think with the tools available now to players they're a, they have large large platforms and they're able to do things with their voice and do things with their actions and what they attach themselves to in their communities to create an incredible amount of awareness and sometimes some really quite fundamental change and I think going back to the example in the USL in the states you're seeing now that players have a solidarity amongst them that they have a different view, a different point of view on allyship, obviously because of the anti-racism social justice movement that particularly that's been happening in the United States and how athletes as, ch as change makers have really been at the forefront of that. So I actually think times like almost there's, I wouldn't say a perfect storm because obviously the perfect storm would be no discrimination in football, right? But I think things are changing and there's a lot that players can do with their platform on the pitch and, and online in particular and, and with their activism. But I think the link between what Dai's talking about is anytime that there is like solidarity between players and fans in particular, I think creates, it really marginalizes the bigotry in a way 
particularly online, where, you know, there's horrific amounts of online abuse towards players, particularly when they speak out about something and it's, you know, they're told to, the, the terminology in the US to shut up and dribble. I think that's changing now. And I think players are just, whether they get flack for it or not, they're just willing to use their platform in a different way. And that's really encouraging. And I think what we have to do is the governing bodies around the game, give them the opportunity to do that, educate them on, on the issues that matter most to them and help them find their voice. But I also think pay really close attention to any time there is an attempt to discipline or sanction them for doing so. And I think that particularly if you if you think about the way the public can can really create kind of, you know, hold court in that space and really um, make clubs, leagues, associations, clubs feel it where it hurts, which is in the back pocket, it becomes this really powerful coalition. So I think what we're seeing recent, what we've seen recently and the way that players are becoming more and more active in social justice movements is really encouraging. And I think that alignment with obviously fan groups who want to have more inclusive environments is critical to that. So for me, I find it really encouraging. Obviously the most encouraging thing would be if nobody had to do anything because everything was going really well, but we're not at that place yet. But I think we're, we're getting to a place where players are more willing to put their hand up as allies, hopefully come out and be role models themselves. And I think that's just going to help create you know, a more inclusive environment for people that come into the game in the future, for sure. It's a good point to go uh, back to Claudia as a representative of the the biggest German, uh, the biggest the biggest FA in Europe. Um, how are you working with your with the LGBT plus fan groups? Is there an involvement uh, in between the German FA with the um, LGBT fan groups, which there are at least on an on a local club level? Yeah, so, um, yes, the DFB is the biggest single sports association, association in the world, I was told. Um, we've got seven million members. Um, to answer your questions, um, yes, we engage with the LGBT plus community because that helps us to um, develop a strategy, what we, what we want to do in that area. Um, in the beginning, when the DFB started working on um, sex, on, on the topic of LGBT um, I plus issues, there was there were most mostly single measures. There was a there was a, a leaflet which was I think quite innovative at the time, 2013. But it focused mainly on the player, on a professional player coming out and um, how clubs can be supported. I think that, that that was good, but there were just single measures, and it was felt that um, a more um, holistic strategy was needed so then um, in I think two years ago uh, a process started um, that we organized stakeholder um, stakeholder consultations so we invited um, not just the LGBTI plus community but also fans um, regional associations NGOs and um, other people that might have something to say on those topics and um, we got a process going of um, gathering ideas, demands, needs, um, so to to yeah to see what's needed and where our role is in that process. And some of those um, some of the things that came out during during that process have already been in implemented. Some are some other um, elements we are working on, um, but in general. Um, we, we might want to work, talk about the measures that we're working on and that we've achieved already, but, but just to, to answer your questions, um, in general, I, for us, that, that's a very good um, way to work on this because um, we feel that um, we, we are close to, to the people that, that we often exclude and that we often don't think about and often um, struggle to to talk to also because they are not very represented not not represented enough in in football yet we're trying to change that but um for as long as they are not there yet then um we try to contact them and invite them to um those sorts of meetings could you just an additional question could you uh, give us an example of uh, 
things which are already implemented or achieved yeah. and also and also maybe how that uh, reflects on also uh, work around the games of the german national team i'm asking because um, i know that the dfb a uh, big part of the dfb's uh, bits for the euro 2024 was social responsibility and yeah. inclusion yeah so um, we have two two big main areas of work. That's for one, um, the national team or teams, so to say, and the international level, the professional game, but also the amateur um, game. That that's where all the, those seven million people are. Um, so they are two two different. They are not completely different, but they have different issues. Um, on the um, international level, so for the for the A team, the men's A team. Um, we had a meeting with fan clubs or, um, for, for um, <coughs> queer, queer football fans were um, in, invited and also other fan groups. And, um, and during that meeting, um, an idea evolved of a, so to say, gender neutral stadium experience. How can we include um, or how can we um, make the environment in the stadium more inclusive and more welcoming for people from the LGBTI plus community? And one idea of that was um, to introduce a unisex toilet. Sounds very um, simple and very um, like a no-brainer, um, but um, it took a lot of effort to to put that into into action. And but now um, at every match of the of the men's team, there is at least one, um, sometimes four gender-neutral toilets where everyone can go to, no matter. Who they are, what their identity is, and also as part of that, um, it was introduced at, the, at those matches. Um, people who come into the stadium and who might face um, a physical search at the entrance, they can choose whether they have that search um, from a male or female um, security officer. And I think that that these might be little steps, and it might look very marginal in the beginning. But I think, or what we heard from from the communities, is that 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 helps them a lot to um, make that decision. Do I want to go to that match or not? I think the, uh, as a follower of the English national team, and as someone who will probably travel to uh, the Euros 2024, uh, if, if England qualifies, uh, I think these kind of initiatives and uh, reassurances from the DFB are good for you to hear. Uh, they're, seems to be uh, an association who is thinking about stuff like this. Could you tell us a bit, uh, A, you mentioned your experiences in Russia during the World Cup, how it was there for you uh, as a uh, football fan, and uh, what uh, you would like others, other countries who will host the Euros uh, next year, as well as the World Cup in, in two years. Uh, are there anything, initiatives you would like to see as an LGBT plus fan in terms of safeguarding assurances? The World Cup was an amazing experience. And um, uh, I think Sarah was talking about the, the kind of perfect storm. And it was a time when um, FIFA and UEFA had both started to realize that they really needed to up their game in terms of inclusion. And um, so, FIFA, as you know, were really keen that um, at Three Lions Pride went to um, the World Cup if possible. And, um, and the FA here, the English FA, were really keen that we were visible too. And so, I mean, this sounds like it should be straightforward, but actually was really complicated. We um, asked to use the um, FA um, uh, logo the the three lions and um that's obviously you know it, there are commercial um entities there are um it costs a lot of money for a company to use it but um it just shows how important at that stage it was for the fa to um show their commitment to lgbt inclusion that um, they allowed us to to rainbow up the St George flag of St George, and then um, FIFA wanted us to display it. And you know, so it was against the law to display a rainbow in Russia um, because um, it's um, against the you know it doesn't promote traditional fa uh, family 
um, relationships. Um, but we understood that we would be safe in the in the stadiums, and obviously we were. That there were issues about how we conducted ourselves outside the stadiums because that security obviously didn't extend uh, beyond um, the, the the matches themselves. Um, but it was, you know, so there was some risk to us. Um, we were more concerned, I think, before we went that there was no risk to um, Russian um, LGBT uh, community and um, had the discussion with um, some of the uh, different community groups about whether a boycott would be preferred, but there, there seemed to be a real sense that um, visibility was important. So, so we went and, and, you know, it was a success. It was a success at a micro level. I think, Andy, you were with us when um, a, a Russian uh, came all the way around the stadium to say, is that a rainbow? Um, and, and he was a gay Russian fan and he couldn't quite believe that these two, two um, worlds could uh, combine. And um, at a macro level, the message went all around the world via social media and via TV. We managed to get the flag behind uh, the goal when uh, Harry Kane scored a penalty and uh, was seen on TV. And, um, and people were messaging on socials. They were messaging their own FAs and saying, why can't we do this? Why can't we have our flag displayed uh, as a rainbow icon uh, in, in um, international matches? So, yeah, it was a really powerful message and we think it's really important to keep that going. Um, I think the other thing that's really, that's really interesting is that, um, and I talked about, about this a bit before about um, FAs just keeping on pushing out the rainbows. Um, and in a way that's to make it less powerful every time that happens, because every time it does, it becomes more usual and there will be less reaction and less reaction and less reaction. And, um, you know, we need to do the same thing with the, with the in, when we can get back into stadiums here, certainly with the in stadium stuff, uh, because the more people see those rainbows, you know, on the one hand, they'll remember that there are LGBT people in the stadium. And so they need to watch what, what they say and how they behave. And, and, um, and another level, it's just like, well, so what, you know, it's a rainbow flag. And so that's, you know, we just need to keep it, we need to keep the momentum going. Yeah, I fully agree. And I hope that uh, you and your uh, fellow fans will also travel to the uh, next competitions um, with England. Uh, and I'm pretty sure you will be involved uh, maybe also with us in the discussions with the respective football associations as well as the governing bodies on what they can do to actually uh, protect and safeguard every fan that travels to these competitions. And uh, I really was there with you at that particular game and it was a pretty moving moment. It was in Volgograd because it was also uh, against this argument which sometimes comes uh, from some countries. Uh, we don't have gay fans here, so we're not just used to it, and it's nothing we would need here to work on it. Uh, and it was an actual fan of the local team who went all the way around the stadium uh, to um, come and seek you out and say thank you for coming and thanks for showing the rainbow flag in a Russian ground. Um, I would now open the floor to any questions to the four panelists you might have. I would like to open with a question for Dai because it, it's touching upon actually the last thing we were discussing. Um, she was discussing. And my question is, do you think that UEFA and FIFA should be leading the change in football as the change is actually required at the core of football? And um, what about then organizing World Cups in non-LGBT plus friendly countries like we had in Russia, which was of course very nice that you went there, but it might be different to go to Qatar, where I think there is still a death penalty for people. So how do you feel about that? And even though FIFA asked you to push those messages and they share those messages, this is maybe a, controver a contradictory uh, message they send now. It's a really interesting um, question, Robin, and um, it's one we discussed before before going to Russia. And as I said, we you know tried to engage with uh, different LGBT communities in Russia to ask them if, if they would prefer a boycott. 
And um, at one stage, you know, we were lambasting um, FIFA and, and UEFA for, um, and, and, you know, still are. Arsenal fans had to go to um, a, a pretty hostile place uh, last year. And, um, but, you know, the other thing is to think about that message in Russia, you know, even in that, that case of the guy who came around the stadium or, or people who stopped us, uh, you know, uh, around stadiums and asked for selfies with the flag. And there were a lot of Russians who went to games because uh, they didn't sell out to uh, the, the national team fans. And um, that wouldn't happen if we just went to places that were okay and, and, and respected their LGBT um, communities. And there's a problem about being in an echo chamber and uh, just perpetuating the same message to people who already engage with it. So um, I think, you know, it's really important for FIFA and UEFA and for local uh, host country um, FAs to, to make fans feel safe, but we do need to, you know, we need to take the message and further afield. And also as fans, we shouldn't be denied opportunities to go to other countries. Um, so um, yeah, it's, it's a balance. We certainly need to feel safe. I mean, interestingly, um, when we were talking about going to Russia, there were far fewer um, men that I know who are a part of the Three Lines Pride setup who wanted to go to Russia than there are who want to go to Qatar. Um, so, and I, I, you know, I think there is, um, there's people go to um, the Middle East as tourists um, currently and, and feel safe. So, um, you know, there's kind of precedent there. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens, but yeah, um, the, the, the global football guardians need to take responsibility for, for our safety. I think we felt it in Russia um, and you know, so now they've got a bit of um, a bit of history. What was the first question? I don't think I answered your first question. So yeah, no, it it was more about like um, they they want to ensure your safety there. They want to get your message there, but maybe it's more about changing it at the core, like not organizing it there. It, I mean, they are the governing body, the main governing body in football, and the. They, they want to get your message across, but then they start off with organizing in, in a non-friendly environment for you. Yeah, I mean, they've been backpedaling, I suppose, because the decisions about host countries were taken um, back in the day still, weren't they? And we have to, um, and, and so in a way, they're um, making the best of, of what, was, uh, what were bad decisions. But um, I, I do think that um, it's important that we, we we get the message out globally. And if that means to go to countries, uh, if that means um, FIFA and UEFA making countries that aren't necessarily um, welcoming, um, safe for us to travel to, then uh, I think that's the kind of, um, that's, that's the way forward. Um, and, and we just have to hope that in future, um, fans are more involved. Um, you know, uh, in in making sure that um, that happens and, and everyone feels safe. Um, yeah. Let's hope. It, football yeah. is just such a powerful message, and um, the, there is a fan family, and it is global. And um, you know, together we can change attitudes. My name is Gigi Alford, and I work for the World Players Association as the director for sport and human rights. And I also coordinate the Sport and Rights Alliance, which World Players is uh, one of the partners along with Football Supporters Europe and six other uh, global NGOs and trade unions. Uh, so I've, um, it's really been a pleasure to be part of the, uh, the project as one of the, the board members. And um, I've really enjoyed getting to, to know everybody and this panel has been fantastic. Um, and uh, I, I just really have two questions to build on some of the previous comments, and they're not directed to any particular panelist. So, um, Martin, maybe you know better who could uh, who could answer. Um, one was to pick up on you know the, the recent sort of you know world headline-making 
uh, news from the San Diego, the, the SD Loyals with Landon Donovan's, um, the video actually of the exchange. And I was really uh, moved, you know, by the, the statements of this doesn't belong in our sport. And I just felt the emotion there. And it was interesting to find out that actually uh, the, the homophobic slur that they protested and, you know, really at a great cost to the team came on the heels of uh, a racial vilification the week before, you know, so uh, it was clear that there was a buildup. And so um, I thought the solidarity was really important. And so my question on, on this is really what, um, because this happened on the field with the players, but what can, you know, we kind of learn from this and do like as fans and, and as part of the, this movement of showing some solidarity, you know, from the, the stands and the field. Um, I would really be curious if there's an opportunity here to advance uh, those initiatives. And then second is actually um, thinking back to the Women's World Cup uh, last year, um, which feels so long ago. Uh, and there were a lot of conversations, you know, from, um, from players, supporters who were saying, you know, uh, these are teams. Uh, so for example, the San Diego Loyals, uh, this player, Colin, I don't remember his name. He's the only openly gay player in U.S. professional soccer, uh, football, sorry. <laughs> so, um, you know, there, there's this comment that, okay, if we, you know, really push back against this, uh, this targeting that he faced, more players can come out, uh, you know, and openly. With women's football, you have a lot of openly gay players. And then you, you know, you see a lot of um, cleaning up the image, right? That the, the players are really still projected as from a PR standpoint, as, you know, largely white and, you know, really emphasizing the sort of straight, um, straight aspects of the, the teams, right? So I'm, I'm curious there to what can, you know, the the movement from the, the fans do to help, you know, make this more accepted. Uh, because from a human rights standpoint, when you do a lot of this covering up um, and, you know, the, the PR kind of pushing aside uh, this image, it does as much damage. Um, you know, even if it's not an unsafe environment, it's still not a welcoming environment. Thank you. I think um, what you said about, um promoting this white aspect or um, this homogeneous look. Um, I think that that's part of the, of the overall um, problem of how we communicate sometimes. And I think um, communication about football need, needs to change. Um, we need to, to show, give more visibility to all aspects of diversity, whether that's um, people with other um, I don't know, other places of origin, whether they, they come from a different place or whether it's um, different genders uh, or different um, expressions of sexuality. I think that that needs to be part of communication because that's how we, how we speak to people and how we reach people. And um, if, we, if we then also want to speak to them, they, they might also want to come to us and then we can, that, then there will be more representation. So I think it's a two way, um, two-way system so i we need to as football we need to speak more um about diversity and what benefit it brings for us and we need to portray that as well but then also as a result more more diversity will come hopefully i'll just um say something uh, and uh, asked about how we can work together to um respond to um discrimination you know, and, and um, as fans, uh, oh, just feel so good to see, uh, obviously not the cause, but feel good to see players um, reacting together in the face of discrimination in the same way as, um, as the Loyals did. Um, and um, it's interesting, I know you've got um, Steph talking this afternoon and um, she's from the um, LGBT plus supporter group at um, Crystal Palace. And um, for crazy reasons, Palace's big derby rivals in this country are um, a Brighton. And so um, Brighton, everyone knows, is kind of like the, um, the San Francisco of, of England. It's um, the um, gay town. And um, it means that fans there 
um, home and away regularly incur homophobic abuse. And to the point that they were one of the last teams to have um, an LGBT plus fan group because they didn't want to go there. You know, everyone assumes they're all gay. So um, anyone who even, you know, uh, I suppose even the gay fans didn't want to acknowledge that they were gay. Um, so um, uh, uh, the Crystal Palace LGBT fan group, Proud and Palace, um, devised a, a, a project called, um, uh, um, I'll, I'll get Steph to talk about it, but it was brilliant. And it engaged all the fans on social media to respond any time they heard any phobia any homophobia and um, we had a similar thing um, here um, and you could monitor the reduction in homophobic abuse so the idea was if you hear something then challenge someone or sing over it or ultimately call a steward um, and uh, so we can um, you know we can turn our backs we can challenge we can call it out we can address stuff together and we now everybody's on social media. There's no excuse not to, to pr pr provide that unity. You know, clubs and fans and players um, can know what's going on at really short notice. So there's no excuse really not, not to work together on this stuff. I work for Football Supporters Europe and we're a fan organization as well. So um, we discuss sometimes with our membership that they have a feeling that professional football players and themselves don't have much in common when it comes to social um, class, when it comes to different um, aspects of their life. And at the same time, however, we think that football players are an important role model for fans and spectators in general. So I was wondering if Sarah could elaborate a bit on um, what to make out of those two statements that on the one hand, they don't have anything in common and on the other hand there should be a role model and how fans and players then could act together better maybe. Yeah for sure that the very interesting statements uh, in terms of the social gap yeah for sure I think there's a bit of a paradigm where it's seen that football is exist in this bubble you know like it's very sort of protected um, as someone used the expression whitewashed and you know really sanitized environment and going back to Gigi's point about the Women's World Cup last year I think also the gap's potentially not as big as people imagine it to be and I think what social media does is it bridges that gap a wee bit and also I think the coronavirus in a way meant that uh, football players and fans were in like interacting a lot more through those social platforms. I just saw a ton of Instagram live videos, a lot of like panel discussions being put together. And I think it really, I think across a number of different ordinarily sort of hierarchical structures, whether that's class, race, gender, sexual identity, a lot of those um, barriers were sort of broken down because we were all having this shared experience. So I think that the gaps potentially not as as far as it may seem and I think players are trying to do more and more and they have done through the recovery sort of resilience period during COVID-19 to be like look we do come from these communities we care about them a lot and we have obviously whether that's financial resources or time as a resource or platform as a resource they want to find opportunities to give back and they've done so at all levels of the game there was a fantastic story um, that we heard at FIFPRO from Argentina about a female footballer who obviously was not earning some of the amounts that maybe an Argentinian men's player was making, but she opened a soup kitchen in her home, you know, because she knew that parts of her community were struggling. And to, to Gigi's point about um, role models and, and visibility and, and what happened at the Women's World Cup is sport is incredible in the sense that it's often unpredictable. So there might obviously be situations where sponsors or FAs try to put an image forward of the sport that isn't obviously very inclusive or representative but I mean Megan Rapino with her pink hair and her NBA girlfriend like was just everywhere and she used her platform and her voice so often to be like I mean I'm pretty sure she said on CNN that you can't win a world cup without the gays like this is these are incredible statements 
And she was so unbelievably good at the World Cup that whether you liked it or not or agreed with it or not, she had the platform through her ability to play the sport so well at the highest level. So I think we we can see, I get, for me, I think the social, I, I mean, and a lot of my answers have been very optimistic, but I think you can see the social gap is closing in a lot of areas and the unpredictable nature of sport means you might want to have the white heterosexual male front and center, but he might not be the one scoring goals. So you actually can't predict who is going to take the spotlight and what they're going to do with it. And I think Megan Rapino demonstrated that at the World Cup last year. And then when she won the, the Best Player in the World Award, she challenged Messi and the other like high-profile male players in the room to do more with their voice. So I think uh, it's a very long-winded answer, but I, I just, I really do believe that that social gap is closing. And I think through the unpredictable nature of sport, through the how empowered players are feeling to use their voice. And I think through the fact that the coronavirus has brought the world a bit closer and made people a little bit more humble, and you know Ronaldo contracted it earlier this week. Like you, you, it doesn't matter whether you live in a bubble or not. You, some things you just can't escape. So I, I think that sort of circumstances have changed that a wee bit. So I find the statements very interesting and but also very debatable in that sense. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, some remarks on that one, also a bit on Greta's question. Um, I, have, I have fully agree, Greta, that uh, there always was and still is a feeling that players and fans, they live in two completely different worlds and uh, don't really have to do anything with each other. The players there with their SUVs and uh, golden stakes and whatever. But uh, it's interesting and it's a bit, as you mentioned, Sarah, as well, at least here in Germany, for the first time, there is now um, a steady dialogue in between the players and the newly formed uh, players union. And that comes uh, from a point because the players themselves also went to the fans because they also have a problem with football as run at the moment, especially uh, when it comes to the COVID measures and how they felt uh, being left alone by their clubs, not being involved in uh, safety protocols, not being involved in any discussion on how football would go on from that point in that situation. And that's exactly what many fans were thinking as well. So uh, here was one topic uh, where in Germany, fans and players are on a, uh, on a proper dialogue. And uh, that dialogue will definitely expand to topics as uh, social responsibility and social inclusion and anti-discriminatory work as well, which is a really good thing. Um, 